Hello and welcome to a new Italian PNC video on the lands of Beyond the Ice Walls on the Nos Confundan Terra Infinita map. So you already probably saw the last episodes, but if you didn't, you should go check them out in the description down below. Uh, the Terra Infinita map is a map made by Nos Confundan, which is a Spanish YouTube channel and also an author of multiple books on the lands beyond the ice walls. I recommend checking out his channel, which will be linked in the description down below. And we have discovered many of the lands portrayed on this map, which shows the universe in a flat universe model, which oh, each uh, plane of existence has its own firmament and therefore its own uh, life and existence as its own self and its own star or slash source of light. So, in the red part of the map, so the ones that are inside this red uh, border, we can see the lands that we already talked about and already discovered uh, throughoutly. So, of course, we started by the planet Earth and, of course, the other circles beyond of it. So, we had the second circle where Germania, Asgard, Pitesha, Libris, the Ancestral Republic and so much more were. Then we went to the third circle, then we discovered the lands of Mars, we discovered the Anunnaki, we discovered the lands of the Custodians, the lands of Jupiter, Angels, Aldebaran, Free Islands, lands of Orion, Isir, uh, Osiris, the Etaminas of the lands of Draco, we then discovered the lands of Venus, the lands of Neptune. Uh, last time, we actually discovered all this part here so from the lands of Eris all the way to the Kurka um, no wait sorry Kura uh, islands frigid islands and today we will be looking even further east and covering the last eastern portion of the map that is in the southeast of the map so as you can see we already have a lot of things more to do for this map but one of the things we can close up with this episode is going to be this part so the entirety of this part of the map will be completely discovered but that said let's actually get into it uh, for today so the first of these planes of existence we're going to talk about is Leonis. Leonis is one of the ones that are least interesting out of the ones we're going to mention today, and that is because it is the one that is not sure to be inhabited by any uh, sentient life form. So as we saw in many other episodes of this series, there are planes of existence which are inhabited by divine beings, they are inhabited by souls of the uh, dead humans, there are some planes of existence that are actually inhabited by extraterrestrials, and then there are some planes of existence existence that are not inhabited by any of these. And in this case, Leonis uh, falls in this fourth category. So uh, Leonis is a plane of existence with two, uh, two continents, two ma uh, mega continents or major continents, and one star or one source of light, as you can see right here, and it has no uh, further circles. So it's literally just their plane of existence, their ice walls, and then their connections to the rest of the universe. Okay, so one thing we have to notice is the fact that Leonis indeed has seas, uh, next to its uh, green continents and it's different in this case from the parts we saw in the last episode which are mainly made by a uh, oceans of helium so nothing you can actually traverse through boat uh, we saw in the last episode as uh, like for the lands of al -Qaeda, that there were these continents that were inhabited by um, like extraterrestrial beings and then the places that were near them had seas but were of course isolated from each other because of the seas of or actually oceans of helium of course helium being a component of this kind of matter makes it impossible to traverse by ship or any other uh, marine type of navigation and instead the only point of traversation is of course the one by flight we also notice the fact that many of these places cannot actually be reached through uh, conventional means. So we have things like the uh, lands of Uranus, which we saw were actually reachable through this gate. And the only way to reach this part of the universe is in fact through this gate in the lands of Uranus. So you would have to traverse the lands of Uranus, as we saw in episode 3, I, I recall, uh, to actually get to the um, lands of Leonis. But even if you get to the lands of Leonis, there's probably not much gonna be there to, for you to explore, as the lands of Leonis are mostly not inhabited by any sentient uh, beings. There has been some accounts that there were some points in history where uh, people or creatures from other planets did manage to uh, arrive to Leonis, 
but to arrive to the firmament of Leonis, you had to have a wormhole, basically. So a special diversion, as we um, saw with the Lands of Storms in the last episodes and the Eternal Fire. So to have a wormhole and actually get into the Leonis, there might have been some civilization in the past that actually reached this, but uh, since there is nothing yet to be found on Leonis now, it's probably gone extinct, or in other cases, it just never got here. Uh, Leonis itself only actually has flora and fauna so basically some kind of animals and uh, mostly if i recall correctly it was explained as some kind of bug so mostly like insects and bugs well in the seas you can find types of fish types of mollusks and stuff like that but there is no uh, superior life form of course there is also flora so you can find trees you can find vegetation you can find fungi but you cannot once again find something more and that is what it comes with Leonis. One of the reasons why there might have not been any civilization actually sprung up from here is the fact that in this uh, plane of existence there has never been a superior species to actually dominate it and the existence of two large land masses has always given the life forms of uh, Leonis enough resources to, contain, uh, to continue living as they were without actually evolving. Like you know how on earth there are tectonic plates that shift around and create continents and create la different landmasses. Well, in Leonis, this never existed. So the two landmasses we see right here, so this western one and this eastern one, remained as such for the eternal history of Leonis. So that never... Uh, got in a situation where the creatures that inhabited Leonis had to move around or evolve to actually get to the other side or to get better resources because everything was already given. So that is why Leonis does not have anything mainly interesting to it. Now if we go south of Leonis, there's a small passage here that can bring to the next plane of existence which is way smaller but is actually more interesting. This is Denebola. Denebola is a frigid landscape so it is in fact not traversable through uh, seas like we saw with Leonis but in, in fact it does have some small oceans that uh, surround their uh, land masses but these are oceans of helium. So it is a very interesting place. Once again this is not uh, inhabited by any extraterrestrial species but it has a history with when it comes to astrology and uh, study of sciences that uh, study the stars and the uh, planes of existence in outer space. So in the case of Denebola, uh, Denebola has been linked up with the, the misfortune and the end of times when it comes to astrology. Uh, Denebola being this, uh, both the name of the star, so you can see the name of this uh, sign of light, and of course also the name of the plane of existence. Uh, in this case, we can see four continents, or at least three continents and one ma uh, minor island existing in the plane of existence of Denebola, as well as, of course, their oceans and their uh, barrier of ice. So, of course, we do have the ice walls that surround it, but once again, interestingly enough, we do have something different when it comes to the extra source, uh, when it comes to the actual surface of the plane of existence. Uh, together with the continents, we have the like kind of transparently blue type of landmass here that is not actually uh, sea or ocean or water, it is actually ice. So you cannot uh, transfer it with it with ships, you have to walk on it. But the problem with that is the fact that these continents are surrounded by oceans of helium. So once again, not traversable by ships. So you'd have to take some kind of uh, walkable or at least um, like some, some, I don't know, some kind of like tank or something like that to go on the ice. And then once you get to the oceans of helium, you had to go from tank to some kind of light focused method of uh, voyage. So that's the only way you can actually reach these continents. Then to the west of Denebola, we have something more interesting once again. Tierra Nueva Tartaria, uh, as it said in Spanish, but it is actually just means New Tartarian Land. So the story of how New Tartarian Land came to be is actually very interesting and very appealing when you know something about the old Tartaria. So the story starts on, once again, Earth. Yes, of course, it's usually Earth that spawns all of these uh, inhabitants of the other, uh, like, planes of existence, and in this case it spawns specifically in the land called Tartaria. So for those that don't know, Tartaria was one of the landmasses that was thought to exist 
outside of Europe and in the north of Asia. It was something akin to modern day Russia, but not completely because it doesn't include uh, like Western Russia, so European Russia, but it did include like the steppes of the North uh, Eurasian Plain as well as parts of Siberia. And Tartaria was believed at some point to be the host of some old and major civilization in history, but this was never confirmed by anyone. And of course, there are a lot of people that just renounce the idea of Tartaria ever being some united entity in a lot of cases. But uh, we do have a story about Tartaria. At some point in history, a wormhole did get created in Tartaria, as it does pretty often in history. And this wormhole actually brought the people that were living in old Tartaria in the lands of New Tartaria. At that point, the lands of New Tartaria were basically useless, they had just some vegetation and nothing else. But the life, was, um, but the species that inhabited Old Tartaria got transported together with the humans into New Tartaria. So not, not only the humans were transported with the Hornwell, but actually the entire landmass they were living on. So in this case, something like a 20 per 20 uh, square mile piece of land was transported to New Tartaria, uh, which caused the new Tartarian land to actually develop and develop together with the lands of old Tartaria, which mesh massed together and created different types of vegetation, as you can see on this map. So we have this original landmass, which was old Tartar uh, which was the new Tartarian original landmass, and then the one that got transported from Earth. So from here, this vegetation that existed in old Tartaria and back on Earth basically expanded upon the rest of the lands in new Tartaria. And since, in fact, these are linked, as you can see right here, there is no ocean of helium together uh, that divides them but it is of course outside of it this meant that basically the humans here could traverse this uh, small part of ocean and sea with ships that they could build on their uh, small landmass and actually came to inhabit the rest of new tartaria uh, the humans that now live on new tartaria or at least used to live on new tartaria we're not sure if they are alive anymore are thought to be are thought to be like the last remnant of old Tartarian culture, of course developed for the uh, hundreds of years. And of course, if somebody might uh, be able to reach that, they could probably observe exactly how old Tartarians used to live, but of course in a different setting. So that is the story of the new Tartarian land, which I think it's one of the most interesting places you can see outside of the ice walls, and especially since it is so far away from Earth. But once again, when it comes to the lands outside of the ice walls, uh, like actual, uh, like distances don't really matter as much as how likely it is for it to be uh, an opening of a wormhole caused once again by the lands of the storms and eternal fire which in case you're confused and don't know what these two are i, re I really recommend watching the last video on the series so episode 4 unless you want to be pretty much confused by what this is and how it is going on so uh, continuing what with what we were doing we're going to go south of the Tierra de Nueva Tartaria and go to the Transmute. So uh, when it comes to the Nucleus 28.6, so this one, I think I might be able to, you know, just explain this, but when it comes to turn the Transmute, I am absolutely appalled and I do not know what it is. I tried to give myself explanations, I tried to uh, learn something online, but there wasn't much information on it and I couldn't really find anything. So if you guys know what the Transmute is, and you know it from like the books of Nos Confundum, let me know in the comments and I will try to like review it and maybe talk about it in a future video because as of now, I really don't know what it is. But when it comes to the Nucleus, I can explain it actually. So in case you don't know, Nucleus when it comes to this part of the universe, so we already saw one in the last episode, it was Nucleus 28.4 and there's another Nucleus up here somewhere. I believe, uh, yeah, Nucleus 28.2, these are basically energy creators. They really are basically um, energy processors that manage to conserve energy that exists in this part of the universe and then use their energy to basically um, like just use as a resource to be used by the other planes of existence near them. So the Nucleus 28.6 uh, conserves energy that is created upon itself as you can see from even the color of the landmass is of course not hospitable to any kind of life form of course being purple really should be an indicator of the fact that this is not uh, like usable for lives to exist of any kind either marine even uh, like uh, flora fauna humanity or anything else any terrestrial life form could not exist 
in something of a beer sphere like the one of Nucleus 286, but of course it is useful to conserve energy created by their massive stars compared to the rest of their um, like circular system, and when this happens, they all conserve on the ice walls and of course on the actual plane of existence, and it is released upon the lands that are near it. So in this case it feeds the Nebola, as well as Leonis, and of course Titanides. But more interestingly, actually, it does feed also the places outside of these, so Thunder Islands, or Thunder Lands, sorry, and then the place we'll see next, the most interesting place we'll see in this entire episode, and I'm sure you guys can't wait for the actual conversation to go to the second earth and the lands of clones, but that is to be seen later in this video. So as for Nucleus 86, I think we covered it enough, then we go to the actual Titanides. Titanides is complicated because we already talked about the lands of the titans and we do know the titans do have already a place where they exist un uh, amongst Uranus, so the uh, god of the sky, actually the prim primal divine being of the sky in ancient Greek mythology, and we already saw how a lot of the titans escaped to the lands of Titania, uh, so of already uh, we can see uh, these information that link up with the Greek mythology. This was all in episode 3, so if you don't know what I'm talking about, go watch episode 3. And for Titanides, I figured out that these basically are the lands where the only remaining titans that do not exist anymore in our world and do not have a place to exist outside of these places we already mentioned go live. So the Titanides are probably the homeland of titans such as Hyperion, which we didn't mention earlier, and probably some other um, minor titans like uh, Neri, so like the um, titan titaness actually of the waters in ancient Greek mythology. So those primal beings that did not have luck when it came to actually founding some um, either gods to like be subservient to or some humans to link up to or even some like other uh, gods to marry even uh, because sometimes that happened in ancient Greek mythology so their cult completely dissipated and ended up dying and that made it so that these titans they don't have any, any like capable entity and force to actually exist near earth which was their homeland and therefore because of their ethereal kind of bodies they had to traverse the rest of the known world and known expansion of the universe to actually find some place that could actually sustain their life forms and in this case we can see it through nucleus 286 that actually sustains the life forms of the, the, the titans in the titanides um, uh, plane of existence this is a bit far-fetched um, of course i'm not sure 100 of what i'm saying in this case i could not find more reliable information but if we go to just uh, uh, sensible conclusions as from seeing the lands of uranus the titania and the lands of Cronus and pan we can probably uh, explain ourselves the titanides as what i've just said also near it we have tierra's ceo i don't know if this is a joke or something i don't know what tierra's ceo is it is pretty funny I, it might be like tierra's chao which would be actually the titan of like uh, the renegade titan that wasn't really counted with the other titans this has some kind of sense if you guys uh, if you guys like if you guys girls and etc go look at the actual genealogy of the titans in greek mythology you will notice that uh ceo or keo there's many names they used there was even a more different name like called polus he was called many names, but he was like one of the minor titans that did not really find any home with the other ones. So we had like my major titans, like we saw with Kronos here. Um, like we saw with Kronos here. And we had primordial beings like we saw with Uranus here. We saw uh, other titans like Atla Atlas and Titania. And then other titans like Hyperion and Titanides. But some minor titans might actually not want to be in the same place as the lands of Titanides. Or even worse, might be uh, banished from living in Titanides or the other lands of the titans. And that is why this specific titan, Seo, or also called Polus, was uh, eventually banished to the lands of the Tierras of Seo, which are literally their name. Uh, the material that is actually on the CO is different from anything else I've seen on this map, so I'm not sure what the actual lands of CO or Terra CO actually look like, but I assume they're only fit to be inhabited by giants and, uh, of course, uh, titans. 
Then, south of Titanides, we have the second last uh, plane of existence of this video, which are the Founder Lands. The Founder Lands can be explained into two different ways. The first way is that the Founder Lands are the place of the founding of the entire universe. So this is the border of the known universe and it might be the border of the actual universe itself. So there might not be anything here. This is literally the end. And the Founders are literally the ones that made the universe, which of course means God. But of course, that means also the first humans, the first living beings of the universe, the first other creatures that then inhabited other parts of the universe, and so on and so forth. The second way you can consider the Founderlands, which is probably one I subscribe to, is that the Founderlands are the Founderlands of the second Earth, of course, Lands of Clones. So one of these uh, theories is the one that basically puts the Founderlands on a major spot in uh, universal history, while the second one puts the Founderlands just only relevant, uh, only as a place of founding from the second Earth and lands of the clones. I'm going to assume, for me at least, that it is the second option, but you guys are uh, like free to just leave in the comments what you think the Founderlands might actually represent. I think it's the one that actually created the uh, lands of clones and not actually the founding of the universe, as I do believe honestly it did start all with Earth. But I might be wrong, maybe I'm just ir um, er what is what is it this called, like Earth-centric maybe? I'm not sure. Terra-centric? Geocentric? Geocentric, like that, that's probably the right word. Anyways, let's get to the actual meat of this video, which is of course the second Earth, also called lands of clones so this is wild all right this will be difficult to even understand as a simple person that is seeing this video but it is extremely interesting so let's start by the first information we got from noscom Fundem when it comes to the second earth and lands of the clones the first thing noscom Fundem explains when it comes to this plane of existence and its original rings is that it was one of the ones that were described by William Morris, which was a navigator and explorer, writer, and uh, even more, he did even more things, like maybe even an actor, I think. And this person was one of the people that went outside of the ice walls and recorded it in his journeys and uh, in his diaries and record his journey in his diaries. And one of the lands he did mention was, of course, the second Earth. He described it as a land which was almost similar, identical to Earth, but it had a nearly feeling of being something that shouldn't exist. And the Noscom Fundem explanation is this. Basically, the second Earth is a living experiment. We have things like the Tierra de Experimentos, which is literally... So if you ever watched a movie called um, The Truman Show, you know how we see this huge dome where like humanity is recreated only as an experiment for a uh, like TV show for fans to watch? That is basically the Terras de Experimentos. So the inhabitants of the inside the lands of clones, so from the second ring inward, they actually created the Terras de Experimentos only to actually create experiments of living outside of the second ring. So they actually started this kind of like a colonial project to have the Terra de Experimentos just to see what humans would uh, exist as if they lived outside of the second ring in the second earth. But eventually it translated into something completely different, which would have a curated society where everybody would be kind of asleep in a consta uh, constant state of not really understanding what was going on. And they, the ones inside of the uh, second ring, would use this to kind of control the lives of the people of the Tierra de Experimentos. And this would go even further to the extent that the people of the Tierra de Experimentos were actually clones. So they weren't just normal humans, but they were clones of uh, literal beings that existed inside of the second earth, second ring. So eventually it became some kind of farm where these humans would just be allowed to live these very uh, contro controlled and very regulated lives and eventually they would be used as some kind of living resource and this living resource can be seen on the other side of this plane of existence which is literally the Tierras de los Organos. In case you don't know what the organos are, I'll just translate the Spanish here. It's literally the land of the organs. These are literal organ traffickers from the second earth. They use the clones to create organs 
too used to the real humans, or at least original humans, that live inside the second ring. But then again, aren't all humans that live in the second earth clones? Well, that's where the actually history of the second earth starts. So the second earth started up not as an original landmass, so not as earth itself, but as a colony and a creation of humans coming from earth. So we explored how, you know, humans can eventually come across wormholes and since they are one of the most resilient species in the entire universe, they usually can kind of adapt to the other environments they find in outer space. Well, this is the case for the Terra, the Nueva Tartaria, and we saw this in a lot of other lands, uh, a lot, a lot of other lands actually, so places outside of the actual second ring and third ring when it comes to earth itself, but we saw this in other places like the lands of Mars, so we have the human colony. We had seen this even in places like the, um, uh, some places here I believe, like in the lands of Tyr, uh, lands of Quayor. So we saw this happen again and again, and this also happens when a new hormone was created upon Earth very long ago. It is believed that this happened before the last ice age ended actually, so before 10,000 BCE. And when this happened, eventually these guys basically were transported, I believe, in the Founderlands, which is why I believe the Founderlands were those that colonized lands in inside of this. But the original story is that they appeared in what we call now America the Second. So America the Second is literally the alternate version of America, like the continents in the uh, like actual Earth. And these guys basically appeared inside of this. They through a normal only humans this time, so no landmass changes, only humans, they appeared inside of this. They didn't realize that they were being transported in another reality, in another like plane of existence. They thought this was the original homeland they were living in. They didn't really, they just thought they got lost, basically. So they never actually they realized that they went from one Earth to another Earth. And this is where the weird stuff starts happening. So, you know how these people really don't know what the world looks like? Because, you know, they couldn't know. They were before modern technology and modern map making technologies were made. So they just found themselves in a new environment that was very similar to the one they left and thought, well, we probably got lost. And they continued society as we know it. So these people transformed America the Second, which is the name we refer to both these continents, which are both, of course, North America the Second and South America the Second, into almost completely parallel versions of our North America and our South America. Then they found many breaches, as you can see, inside of their own ice walls, and they discovered other places. So, of course, the most important ones was Europa the Second, of course, which was an almost parallel copy to Europe of our own world. And this is where another interesting thing happens. So, and this is probably something you have to know some, uh, I don't know if you can call it an urban legend, I believe it's more like um, a story that a lot of people know about. So the story of the man from Taurid. Uh, once again, I'm going to go directly from what the, the Nos Confunden uh, uh, source uh, tells. So there's this story of a man called the man from Taurid that in 1954 was uh, found in a in an airport in Japan. So you know Japan from the actual earth, let's just get to there very quickly. So you see, you have Japan right here, wait, there's, yeah, right here. And this man just comes up in an airport right here and goes like, okay, so the customs service asks, where are you from? And the man goes, oh, I'm from Torred, uh, Britain, T-A-U-R, ED. And of course the custom service says, okay, where that where's that? Can we have some documents? Can we have some information? And this guy pulls up the documents, pulls up the information, and pulls up all the descriptions and passports. And it's so matching and it so makes sense. It says Torrid, it has the flag, it has the emblem, it has a passport, it has information about the country, it has the currency, the language, everything, and so on. The like checkup brings this to their boss and their boss says maybe he's confusing itself uh, with Andorra 
So they ask him if he's from Andorra, Andorra being a little country, a very small country, almost a micro country inside of Iberia, in the border between Spain and France. And he says, no, no, I'm, I'm from Taurad. Taurad is a nation between France and Spain. So it just looks like Andorra, but it is not Andorra. And it's way much larger, and it did participate in World War II, according to this guy. So the situation devolves even worse, where at a point people start getting doubts and some people start calling him a space traveler or someone that changes dimension and something like this. And at some point the police apprehends him because they think he's some kind of scammer that he's trying to get in the country legally and they bring him in a, into a hotel and they surround and surveil him for the entire night. When they go back into his room, he isn't there, he's completely vanished. And so are all his documents. And this is the only account we have of the man from Taurid. And the way this is explained is that this man was from the lands of clones, or the second earth, from Europa the second. So in this case, Europa the second had probably one country that was called France, one country that was called Spain, and also had a country that was called Taurid, and it was between them. And this man, this poor guy, just got into a wormhole without even noticing, a special distortion happened, and boom, he was in Japan, in our Earth. And then, just a day later, boom, he's back home, or at least we hope so, because probably he didn't want to go anywhere else, honestly. He was probably very lost. And that explains the Second Earth and Lands of Clones, and of course, America the Second and Europa the Second. But what about the Grande Tierra de los Desertores? What this means is literally the big land of the deserters, which are the people that actually realize what is happening in the Tierra de Experimentos. So those that actually reach Tierra de Experimentos and realize it's all a big experiment that is concorded and used by the people inside the second ring of the lands of clones, then realize they are clones and try to escape. And those that try to escape are not simply left alone. They are... Since this place is highly surveilled, and the entire purpose of it is literally just creating basically human resources for the lands of the organs. And therefore, these people are sent to the Tierra de los Desertores. Well, you probably ask, well, what's the problem with it? It seems pretty good, it seems pretty lush. Well, in the Tierra de los Desertores, there is nobody. There only are the deserters that come to, from the Tierra de Experimentos. These continents used to be inhabited much like Europa II, America II, and used to be called Asia II and Africa II. But they were left upon after they realized that these continents had no natural resources in them, and differently from all other places we saw on the second Earth, they were not hospitable for human life. So those that escape the Tierra de Experimentos have a whole a big... Um, all have a huge ceremony dedicated to them by those that they believe to be the ones they're reuniting with, so the real humans from the second uh, ring and inside of it, and instead of it, they are actually transported to the Tierra de los Desertores and are considered deserters forever. So they do not take their organs, so they are left alive, but they are literally left to starve and die out in the Tierra de los Desertores. There is some kind of belief that at some point some people might have been able to actually uh, remain alive in the Terra de los Desertores and maybe just survive with the small resources they were uh, left with, maybe coming into the hinterlands of this continent, but the reality is they were probably left to die and never came back. So that probably just does it for the plane of existence of the second earth and the lands of clones. So. I hope you guys really enjoyed what we see and we, what we learned today. It's time to actually expand our little circle here, we expand every time. As you already probably noticed, we have this major, major, major line we're gonna be tracing today, which will go all the way right here, so we told about everything in here, and of course, that really connects the two places. As you can see now, we almost explained probably more than two-thirds of the entire map. So, of course, this is Terra Infinita, so it's literally infinite land, there's so much more to know, and of course there are unknown zones that might be explained later by uh, Noscon Fundem himself, so we might even know more information in the future, but for now, I'm very glad that we managed to get so much of this information done, and so much of information finished. If you're liking the series, and if you don't, if you're liking the series, and if you want to know more, 
watch the other videos we had already, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss another ones, and if you want to help the series to spread and get to like 3000 views in 2 days, then add a comment so the algorithm spreads this video to all the ones seeking the truth about the lands outside of the ice walls. Thank you for watching and we will see each other next time. Goodbye.